Quiet, please. Quiet, please. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called In Memory of Bernadine. It's a long, long ride home. It's been a long, long war for me, and I've seen places I never expected to see. I'd just as soon not have seen them. But I'm going home now. At last. It won't be the kind of homecoming Bernadine and I planned. No, not at all. How are you about depending on a woman? The woman you're in love with, I mean. Are you like me? I suppose not. I imagine I'm different. I depended so much on her that I... Well, I don't know how I got by without her. As a matter of fact, I suppose I didn't. I guess that's why her memory, uh, the memory of her, I mean, is still so important to me. What did I do before I met Bernadine? You know, it's strange. The part of my life before her is all hazy and indistinct, like, uh, well, like when I was a kid in school and we made watercolor sketches. (laughs) The paper was wet and... And the colors all ran together, no matter how carefully you drew in a tree or or a house or something. That's the way my life seems to me before Bernadine. And that's the way it is, too, since this other thing happened. All I've got now is her memory. Well, that'll last me. I wish I could see her, though. Everything would be all right. It was Latin. You know, high school Latin. I was the prize dumbhead in Latin. I remember the first semester I got a fast 20 on the exam, and Mr. Patton, we used to get a laugh out of his name, Mr. Patton, he teaches Latin. Mr. Patton said to me, Charlie, I have enormous admiration for you as a fullback, and I predict a great career for you in college. But, Charlie, he said, if you want to be All-American at Northwestern or wherever you're going, I advise you to avoid the study of Latin. Because, Charlie, he said, If you don't avoid it, they'll throw you out on your ear after about 20 minutes, no matter how far you can throw a football, and that will be sad, Charlie, he said. (laughs) Well, it was good advice, certainly. But Bernadine sat next to me in the Latin class. So I stayed. Remember that thing in Cicero, I guess it is, where he's talking to Catalina, the place where he says, How long, O Catalina, will you continue to try our patience? Cosque tandem abutare, Catalina, patientia nostra. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Then Mr. Patton will never forgive me. Well, I was dreaming about something, Bernadine maybe, and he called on me and I got up and said, Cosque tandem abutare, Mr. Patton, patientia nostra. So I got thrown out. Isn't it funny how things start? So silly. How a little thing like that can affect your whole life. I was sitting in a little drugstore on Bryn Mawr that afternoon. No, no sin kids came in there much, and I was feeling sorry for myself. You know how it is, the football big shot, and he makes a fool of himself. I was drinking and Walded, all alone in a booth back at a magazine rack, and somebody stopped alongside me, and I looked up. It was Bernadine. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Bernadine. Mind if I sit down with you? Well, I was just going to go. I'm only going to be a minute till I drink my Coke. Well, sure. Uh, sure, sit down. Mm. We going to win Saturday? I don't know. Hyde Park's got a good team. We got a good one, too. Yeah, sure. They won't miss me. Not going to play. After that crack that Mr. Patton teaches Latin, I'll be lucky if I stay in school. He isn't going to do anything about it. Yeah, says you. No, he isn't. I know. How do you know? I know. I asked him. What do you mean, you asked him? Well, I got to thinking. I knew you didn't mean to do it. Well, I didn't, Bernadine. Of course. Everybody does things like that sometimes. Well, he was pretty sore. Listen, did he really say he wouldn't do anything about it? Well, at first he was pretty sore. But after a while, he laughed a little bit, and he told me about how absent-minded he used to be. He laughed some more, and he said, well, we have to be Hyde Park, don't we? So I guess I'll overlook it. 
No kidding. No, no kidding, Charlie. How about that? I promised him you'd really go to town on your Latin, Charlie, from now on. Yeah, sure, I... What? You mean I get back in the Latin class? Of course. But... But look, Bernadine, I can't understand Latin. I, I mean, I only stayed in the class in the first place on account of you. I mean... Uh... On account of what, Charlie? Well... Oh, I don't know. Listen, Bernadine, I'll flunk. I know I will. No, you won't. I'll help you. Yeah, but... Say, wait a minute. What? You talked Patton into letting me stay. Didn't you? Well. Why? Well, school spirit, I guess. School spirit. Sure. You know, die for dear old Sam and stuff. You know, I don't believe that, Bernadine. You don't? No. What do you believe, then? <laughs> I'm, I'm scared to tell you. No, go on. Tell me. Well, you... Well, you know why I asked Patton to let me stay before. No. Don't you? Yes, Charlie. I, I think I do. Well, is that why... Why you asked him not to throw me out? I mean, the same reason, maybe? Well, usque tandem abutere, Charlie. Patientia nostra. Bernadine. Oh, 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 oh. oh what you've done. Oh, Charlie, you do need somebody to take care of you. <laughs> A thing like that, and it affects the rest of your life. Your life and hers. And the thing rolls on and on, like the snowballs we used to push around when we were kids, and pretty soon the little bobble you made in high school has affected the lives of hundreds and hundreds of other people. Maybe a German corporal named Helmut Schwartz would still be alive instead of dead in the snowbank in front of the boys' school in Dierkirch. Maybe Harry Foster would be dead. Maybe... Well, it's no good wondering now. I want to think of Bernadine. Bernadine said I needed somebody to take care of me. And in the years that had slipped by since I knocked a glass of malted milk all over a green and white sweater, she's done it. Until now. And now I have just the memory of her. We, we made a joke out of that Latin thing. You know how family jokes are. Never very funny to anybody else, but well, they're real stoppers to you. And it is funny how many times that phrase, how long, crops up in a conversation. We, we made a ritual of it. We never said, how long. We always said, vousque tandem. It's funny. I wanted us to get married as soon as I was graduated from Sam, but Bernadine said, no, I was to go to college. So I went to Northwestern one year, and of course she went with me. Well, I wouldn't have gone otherwise. And then we got married. I understand, Charlie. No, you... No, you don't, Bernadine. I think I do, darling. Well, well, I just can't help it. Of course not. Do you think I'm a... Now, Charlie. Well, I can't help it, Bernadine. Do you think I'm a weak sister? Why should I think that? Well, I don't know, but... I depend on you so much. I'm glad you do, Charlie. I don't know what I'd do without you. I don't know what I'd do without you. You do love me? I do love you. Rose, great <laughs> Don't you remember what Dr. Watson said, darling? Till death do us part. Yes, I remembered. And I could never forget it. I could never get it out of my mind. If I should lose I suppose I was morbid. Young men often are, especially when they're in love with girls like Bernadine. I suppose I was tiresome to her with all my mooning about did she love me, would she always love me, and with my constant leaning on her for support in everything I did. I wonder if many women realize how important they are to the men they marry. I know, quite simply and surely, that I would never have amounted to do anything without Bernadine. And... Now that's a chapter that's closed. The whole book's closed. And when you close that book... It began to look like war was coming sooner or later. A lot of fellas I knew had joined the National Guard. I sort of... Well, I sort of toyed with the idea myself. And one night I mentioned it to Bernadine. 
I'd, I'd gotten a habit of consulting her about everything. I just mentioned it to her. And she looked at me over her glasses and she said, I'd be very proud of you, darling. Then something rose up in my throat and I could feel it choking me. And, and I heard my voice speaking and I didn't recognize it at first. It, it's been a long time since you've been proud of me, hasn't it? I, I don't know what had hold of me. I, I couldn't stop now I'd started. I said, I mean just what I say. Here I am with a little a little two-bit peddling job, and we haven't got enough money to buy you a decent dress, and, and I had to borrow $90 on my salary last month, and Hanson's talking about cutting down the staff at the office. Charlie, I... darling. Oh, cut it out. I don't understand, dear. Well, you don't, huh? Then why did you say you'd be proud of me? You said it because you're not proud of me. Because you don't give a hoot about me. Because you... You're sorry you married me. Charlie, is something wrong with you? Oh, that's right. Rub it in. I'm a failure. I have to ask your advice about everything. I haven't got sense enough to... Charlie, dear, please. And she came over to me and reached for my hands, and I jerked my hand away. And I struck her. Yes. I can see her now, this very second, standing there in the print of my hand across her cheek, standing out scarlet red against the white. And a little drop of blood welled up from her cheekbone where her glasses had cut her. Oh, I've seen blood since, plenty of it. But that I'll never forget. Not ever. And I never got that picture out of my mind. Oh, forgive me, Bernadette. But it's one of my memories of her. That I'll always have. And it hurts. More than you'll ever know, Bernadine. I can't talk about that anymore. I, I had to tell you. And now I've told you. Now you'll be charitable to me. And listen. Yes. I joined the National Guard, the 131st in the big black old armory at 16th and Michigan. And I was pretty unhappy after a month or two. I wondered why I'd let myself in for such a thing. It was easy to stay away from drill Thursday nights, and I, well, I did a couple of times. And I'd made up my mind to skip it for a third week. That was the night she met me as I walked out of my office. Today. I thought we'd have dinner downtown, then I'd go over to the armory with you, Charlie. Why, well, I... I was going to go over these invoices for Hanson tonight, honey, and I thought I'll help you with them when we come home. You know, you were telling me about that wonderful place where you have lunch so often. You said they had such wonderful spaghetti. I haven't had any spaghetti for so long. Well, of course I was trapped. I like spaghetti, too. And Bernadine liked me in my uniform, and after drill, when I came downstairs with Harry Foster, my platoon sergeant, she told him so. I think Charlie makes a very good-looking soldier, Sergeant. Don't you? I certainly do. I was just saying that to the captain tonight. Well, I suppose the ROTC experience in ten makes a difference. It doesn't hurt. How long does it take to get to be a sergeant? Why, uh, Charlie will have to be a corporal first, you know. But, well, you can't tell. It won't take too long. That's the way it was. Bernadine could do anything. No, no, she didn't work on Harry Foster. I wasn't made a corporal because Harry liked me. I didn't get to be a sergeant because of it either. I worked for promotions because Bernadine... Well, you understand, I know. So when 1940 came and they called a guard in the Federal Service, I was a first lieutenant. Tullahoma, Tennessee. People called it a lot of names, but, but for me... Bernadine was there. I was a very good officer, I was told. And I knew why I was. No, well, of course. And as the certainty of eventual war grew and grew, I, I began to think about the future. I, I was all right here where I could go home to Bernadine almost every night and be quietly reassured. I had no illusions about myself. What would happen when the inevitable time came and I would leave troops in battle? Without Bernadine to lean on. And I think Bernadine knew it, too. She must have known that without her, I was... What I said once, a weak sister. 
And I think she was afraid, too. If not as afraid as I was. Time came when they sent us down to Louisiana for the big maneuvers. This was to be the first test for me. Alone. Not a miracle happened. They assigned me to General Ben Lear's Second Army as a sort of chief clerk, a very unimportant job. Then we moved into the schoolhouse at Winfield, far, far back from the bayou country where Eisenhower and Patton and Kruger and tough old Ben were watching the young officers and deciding who'd made the grade and who wouldn't. And then one night, a couple of wild-eyed soldiers in one of the opposing Third Army outfits decided to pull a commando raid on Second Army headquarters and see if they could kidnap a general or two. I was sitting in what had been the principal's office when the raid started. I opened the door just in time to inhale about half the contents of a G.I. smoke candle, which the raiders were using to simulate grenades. Well, it isn't funny when you get a lung full of that stuff, although I doubt it would kill you. Anyway, I passed out. And it seemed long hours afterwards that I came to out on the lawn. I recognized Bill Westlake standing beside me and Brooks Watson and Barney Oldfield. I had my head in somebody's lap. And then that somebody spoke to me. Feel better, darling? Sure. It was Bernadine. Bernadine. Holding my head in her lap in Winfield, Louisiana, in the middle of what was awful close to war. Nice feel, Charlie, darling. The doctor said you'll feel better in a little while. How did... You get here. I just thought I'd come see you. You glad? Yes, I was glad. You know what she did? She wangled three days for me from Ben Lear, and she took me to Lake Charles, and Curtis DeWare, the PRO there, got us a room in the Charlton Hotel, and, and I got well fast. Then we had a talk the night before I had to go back to Winfield. Well, I had to tell her about my doubts of myself, and and the fears that were gnawing at me. And I did. I squirm now when I when I remember all the things I told her. I know, darling. You don't have to tell me. Please don't talk anymore. Charlie, I'll always be with you. I'll never leave you. You don't have to worry, dear. Wherever you go, I'll go. Why, Charlie, whenever you're worried about something, you just think about me, darling. Think about me, and I'll be there beside you, no matter where you go, darling. Now go to sleep, dear. Go to sleep. Bernadine's here with you, and Bernadine will always be with you. Till death do us part, remember? Go to sleep. Go to sleep. <laughs> captain of infantry in the army of the United States in Lake Charles, Louisiana in September of 1941. Three short months before Pearl Harbor. Oh, a pretty sight. Yet, there was an assurance of strength there in that room with me. The strength far beyond anything I'd ever known. And I slept in the sure faith that Bernadine had given me. Well, there's not much more to my story. Bernadine went with me wherever I went, to the Carolina Maneuvers, to Fort Benning, to Fort Bragg, to Kilmer. And then a day came when there was only time to kiss her goodbye, the train waiting. Beyond that, a dock and a ship and an ocean and war. Africa and Sicily. And I worked at a deck. England. And a day in June... In France, and the winter coming on. And suddenly I was ordered to an infantry outfit. I thought of Bernadine so many times, I had plenty of opportunity to write to her. She wrote to me. I was safe. But now, well, Harry Foster, by one of those unbelievable coincidences of war, Harry from the 131, I told you about him, Harry was second in command of an outfit of the 5th Division that I was assigned to command. I remember snow. I remember German tanks. I remember Luxembourg and the, the smashed castle on the hill of Bianca. And cold and snow and dead men. And a night came when I, when I knew I was done. I knew I should I'd go mad before morning. 
I was with Harry Foster alongside the wall of the railway yards opposite what had been a boy's school in Dickers. There was that German corporal I told you about, Helmut Schwartz. He had a P-38 pistol and a potato masher grenade. Harry shot him just as he was raising his arm to toss the grenade at us, and I saw the snow turn dark under his body. And at that moment, I knew I had enough. Harry had just started over to the dead German when I, I saw the long nose of an 88 inch its way through a smashed window in the school. And directly in front of the gun's muzzle, you, Bernadine! I heard him scream your name, Bernadine, and I looked up just in time to throw myself flat in the snow. The shell went over my head, and I remember it hit an abandoned locomotive at the yard behind us. I got back to Charlie. I got back just as the German tank moved in on us. I still had my back turned to it when the blast from the machine gun hit me. I wasn't knocked right out. I remember how he stood over me. The machine gun slugs were cracking the air all around him. He looked down at me, and he said your name again. Bernadine, he said. Then he turned back to the tank, and I could see you. And Bernadine was there, just as she said she would be. Bernadine's arm was around me, and I could feel her strength flow into me. And then there was another tank coming up. And I wasn't afraid, Bernadine. I wasn't afraid at all. And now I'm almost home on the homecoming I dreamed about so often. And it's so different. Well, no bands, no, no people smiling, no laughter. All the way from Luxembourg across France, in a ship with all the quiet soldiers. And the train pulling into LaSalle Street Station with me and a few other Americans. In boxes with a flag over each one. And all of us with our memories, Bernadine. And why do I keep remembering that little question of ours? Rousque tandem. How long? How long? It's forever, isn't it, Bernadine? He said, till death do us part. That's forever, isn't it? No, it's not forever, dearest. Death can bring us together again someday. Quousque tandem. You have listened to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chapman. And Bernadine was played by Nancy Sheridan. Harry Foster was Malville Ruick. Music for Quiet, Please is composed and played by Gene Perazzo, who, by the way, concludes his engagement with us tonight, friends. Gene, Bill, and I want to thank you for your helpful and artistic collaboration over the past six months. We're going to miss you, and I know our listeners will. Thanks and good luck. And now for a word about next week's Quiet, Please, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Next week's story is called Come In, Eddie, which is about an unexpected visitor at midnight. And so until next week, at the same time, I'm quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please comes to you.